what we're seeing is that despite the fact that we specialize athletes, and we have tons of money that goes into AAU basketball and AAU football, right? Um, we've, we're creating athletes who can jump higher, can you know, lift heavier weights, they're more explosive, they're bigger, you know, they're on more steroids. Despite that fact, injury rates are accelerating across all of our major sports. We're making people who are fragile. We're making people who are uh, you know, not functional human beings at the base of their f athletic ability. Um, to quote Ido Portal, we are humans first, we are, special, uh, we are generalist movers second, and we are specialists last. Right now, we are trying to jump way right past building your fundamental human capacities, right past building your general movement capacities and into that specialist. And even the stuff like, you know, to be frank, Edo stuff, it's very specialized to me. It's movement on flat ground. It's hand balancing. It's gymnastics ring strength. These are not the natural expressions of human movement. This is not what we evolved for. We evolved to be able to move through the natural world, to be able to fight, to be able to cooperate and hunt and to be able to throw, you know, catch all those things are basically related to hunting tasks. And I believe that you're going to get the best and most robust movers when you combine all of these things. That's what we're really looking at is if you want to be an athlete who can do everything that a human being should be able to do, you should be able to locomote through your environment. You should be able to move effectively with other people. You should be able to deal combatively with another person. You should be able to cooperate with other people. You should be able to throw and catch and carry and strike and um, you know, manipulate objects powerfully. Those are the fundamental human tasks. If you look at how children play in every culture in the world, you'll see that they replicate all of these in their play. A well-socialized child with ample opportunity to play and well-socialized playmates, lots of good stuff in their environment is going to explore all of these because they're fundamental to the human being's movement adaption. Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, Rafe here from Evolve Move Play, coming at you with another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. So today we're going to be doing a solo podcast, which I'm really excited about. It's kind of the core um, work that I've been working on intellectually recently, which is the connection between aliveness, which is a concept that I learned of from martial arts, um, what's called the constraints-led approach, and what's making parkour such a powerful um, and disruptive discipline. So I want to share my thoughts about how all those things come together and how they kind of create a map for what I'm going to call the universal athletic human blueprint. So we're going to be sharing all those ideas with you. I'm really excited about that. Before we go deep into that, though, a little bit of housekeeping. So many of you know, we released Return to the Source at the beginning of the year that sold out in just a week. Um, we are now doing another residential seminar, which is going to be the spring retreat, Awaken Your Movement, August, or sorry, May 14th through the 17th. So uh, Return of the Source sold out in a week. We've got six spots already filled for this. There's 14 spots left. If you want to join us, make sure to jump on the link in the description here and um, get on a call, apply to join us. It's really an incredible experience. There's nothing else like it. It's going to be four days in the woods on my family property, going to Whatcom Falls, going to Volunteer Park, going to these incredibly beautiful places. So we look forward to seeing you guys there. So that's the housekeeping. Um, and yeah, onwards to aliveness. Bruce Lee famously said, fear not the man who's practiced a thousand punches. Fear the man who's practiced one punch a thousand times. And while there's some truth to this, I think that there's also something deeply misleading. There's something that's been missed. And I think a much more powerful way to frame this would be fear the man who's uh, tried to punch or practiced punching a thousand resisting opponents. 
this, this is really where movement skill is generated, is in that interaction with the environment in which you have to apply it. So it doesn't matter if you practice a punch a thousand times or 10,000 times or a hundred thousand times in isolation. It matters if you've done it in a live context. Um, and I think that this is, this is a error that is common throughout our, um, our physical education system. We have tended to believe that movement skill was a set of archetypal patterns and that when we mastered those patterns, we would be good at the task that was related to them. So when you're looking at martial arts, that's punching, right? You can practice a punch in the air. You stand in a line in your karate class and you go, right? Or you practice your kata. And eventually by practicing these patterns, the idea is that you're gonna be able to solve the real situation of a fight. And this is something we see within the traditional martial arts, but it's also something we see within our physical practice across many different disciplines. This idea that we're sort of like a machine and once we've been programmed with the right motor program, we're going to be able to execute it and solve a real problem. But that's not actually how the human organism solves problems in its environment. You know, it's, the problems we face are not mechanical, they're ecological. So we have to be dynamic problem solvers. So the first great re realization for this, for me, starts with MMA. And I think there are three trends that we can look at that all are pointing towards the same direction of how do we come to understand solving human movement and creating more adaptable, more capable human movers. Um, and the three big trends that I see that I think are really worth highlighting in showcasing what this means are the rise of MMA, the rise of parkour, and what's now called the constraints-led approach. And there's many predecessors of it um, in the team sports world. We find something common in all of these. So let's start with MMA. In 1993, I believe it was November 12th, 1993, Hoist Gracie, who was a 170 pound um, Brazilian surfer kid, uh, went to an arena, was locked in a cage with three much larger, more muscular men in a row, and defeated all of them in under two and a half minutes uh, at the first UFC Ultimate Fighting Challenge. This was a no holds barred tournament. This is not the modern UFC that you may have seen with gloves and lots of rules. There were very, very few rules. You couldn't eye gouge, you couldn't fish hook, uh, and you couldn't bite, and that was it. Other than that, everything was allowed. Um, and this slender Brazilian kid took out a boxer, he took out a karateka, and he took out a professional wrestler. Um, so in the aftermath of that, the world of martial arts had to change. It was a huge shockwave through the entire world. Um, prior to that, most martial arts training was done through karate and kung fu schools. And the primary focus in those schools was on the learning of set patterns and kata or forms. So you would practice doing a punch against the air in a line with a bunch of other people, or you would practice uh, a series of movements in a similar context. I started martial arts when I was six years old and I trained in this context. I was doing Tang Soo Do, um, and then I went on to do Kung Fu. And we continued to train in this context. So um, what it turned out was that was not a really effective movement education for combat. And we saw this as we saw which martial arts were successful within the field of no holds barred fighting or mixed martial arts as it became known. Now, there was a thinker who was very influential on me named Matt Thornton, and we'll have him on the podcast soon, but Matt Thornton um, described all of the martial arts that ended up being successful in MMA as having this characteristic of aliveness. And those martial arts, for those of you who aren't familiar, were not karate in the beginning, not Kung Fu, um, not Aikido. Um, it was uh, actually Jiu Jitsu, of course, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which we've already mentioned. American wrestling, which at the time wasn't even considered a martial art. American uh, or Western boxing. And, uh, and Muay Thai, which was a, a martial sport from Thailand that was not very well known at the time. Much less well known than karate. But fighters who had a Muay Thai base 
were very successful. Fighters who had a wrestling base were very successful. Fighters who had a, uh, a sorry, a, um, a jiu-jitsu base were very successful. Most of the other martial arts were not initially very successful. Over time, we've seen some successful karate fighters. We've seen some successful sandal fighters. They tend to come from very specific schools that have some of those characteristics that you can identify in those primary arts that were successful. And that characteristic is what Matt Thornton talked about as um, aliveness. So an alive application of a skill, right? Like throwing a punch is when you're having to deal with somebody else's timing, rhythm, and energy is the way that Matt Thorne described it. Another way to describe it is that a live movement training in the context of martial arts is dealing with a resisting opponent in a free play situation. That means that there, there's no um, pre-scripting to the movements. You have to figure out how to hit the other guy while he's trying to figure out how to hit you, and you're both trying to avoid being hit by each other. Or if it's grappling, how to control the other guy, get him into a lock, etc. Every martial art that was successful in the UFC shared this characteristic that at the center of their training, there was an extensive amount of time spent in this resistant free play. That, um, that's you know, it, it was a major thing that, that, that we didn't understand about movement in the martial arts community was that it didn't matter how many times you practiced the punch if you hadn't practiced it against a resisting opponent. And this characteristic of aliveness, aliveness was very influential in my thinking about what makes an effective mover. Now, some few years after that, around the same time really that, that this was happening, there was a group of kids in France who were developing what would become parkour. In 1997, um, the first, the first um, film was made of parkour by, by the commercial media, right? I believe it was Stade 2 in France did a feature on these young parkour kids. And from there it exploded first in France. And in 2001, um, there was a, an, a documentary called Jump London that was released in England. And that started to spread it through the rest of the world. Here in the States, there was a Ripley's Believe It or Not episode about um, the parkour community, which was the very beginning of the parkour community here. Only a very tiny number of people, probably less than a dozen overall, uh, even got started then, but the seeds were beginning to be planted. So now when I started parkour, I was training gymnastics. And I also had had a history of an, an interest in track and field. Took a lot of interest in it. I trained it on the side. I never trained formally with a team until years into my hardcore uh, experience. But, um, but I was very aware of it. So I was always thinking about this new sport of parkour in some sense in comparison to those, those uh, established sports of gymnastics and, and, uh, and track and field. And, you know, when we first started, the, there was all these kids all around the world you know the people who started parkour were mostly young mostly in their teens um, mostly were kind of geeky kids who didn't have a lot of athletic background before it um, and we mostly looked like that when you saw us online in the early days of parkour the skill levels um, that you see now in the media would be unimaginable back then uh, it was it was very different it was very different you know to see people like um, a very simple skill like a kong vault which you know uh, a healthy athletic young person can learn in, in an hour today uh, was a skill that many of us took six months to develop back then. Um, and now people are doing, you know, uh, Kaylin Chan recently did a 360 Kong into a 360 Gaynard backflip. Um, so that's, that's the kind of skill levels that we are seeing. So, Gymnastics and parkour have some very comparable skills, right? Gymnasts swing and release off of the bar and land on the ground. It's called a dismount. And parkour athletes do the same thing off of bars outside. And then they have some skills that are very much not comparable, right? Uh, there's no like twisting and spinning on your foot um, in a specific position on a balance beam in parkour like there is in say women's gymnastics. So there's some things that are totally comparable and some things that are not comparable. So it's always dangerous to potentially compare athletes. But over the years, I've always asked the question, if you took the very best parkour athletes in the world and you asked them to train as gymnasts, you took the very best gymnasts in the world and you asked them to train as parkour athletes, you know, who would be closer to an elite level at the end of a year in their new sport? 
And I always felt that it was the gymnasts, right? And 10 years ago, or, you know, Kohei Uchimura, who's the best gymnast in the world, it was like, he could pick up what we were doing and it would be very hard for us to pick up what, what he was doing was what I felt like. But I don't feel like that anymore. I think that now the very best parkour athletes in the world are doing skills that are at a comparable level of difficulty to the very best gymnasts in the world. Um, and so there's areas where there's overlap and where the, the gymnast would quickly learn what the parkour athlete has and vice versa. And then there are areas where there's no overlap and, and both would struggle a lot. And it would really come down to the individual athlete probably where who would, who would succeed. But um, in those areas that, that they overlap, which is things like, uh, you know, a, a flyaway or a dismount skill off of a bar, we now see that elite parkour athletes are doing skills that are comparable to those of elite gymnasts. Um, so my friend, Nate Weston, former student of mine, who, you know, to be fair, did have some gymnastics training, has done a triple backflip outdoors. Um, this is a skill that's rated, I believe, an E, and the scale of skills in gymnastics goes up to an F. Now, F skills are extremely rare. Almost nobody is competing F skills at the international level. So he's competing a skill that would be considered, or he's showcasing a skill that would be considered a, um, you know, a, a very, very high value skill in a elite national or international level gymnast routine, a triple backflip uh, off of the high bar. Uh, Jared Nahulu, who I don't believe has any gymnastic experience, who's primarily self-taught out of the Apex Denver, has done double twisting, double backflips off of high bar. Um, that again, I believe is a knee skill. And um, you know, that's what most athletes in, in gymnastics uh, are dismounting with. Now, a lot of those athletes can do it perfectly laid out with very nice form and pointed toes, and Jordan isn't doing that. But um, nonetheless, he's also doing this off of a metal bar that doesn't have the spring that a gymnast does, and he doesn't have access to the kind of matting. You know, he's doing this, I've seen him do this onto a three-quarter inch rubber mat above concrete at the uh, um, North American Parkour Championships um, three years ago, I believe. So. We're now seeing that basically parkour athletes or free running and parkour athletes at the top of their game are flipping and spinning comparable numbers of rotations to elite, uh, elite gymnasts. At the same time as they're doing that, they're also doing things like Nate has done a side flip precision onto, you know, eight feet out. You know, he's get, gone over an eight foot gap and landed on a rail on his feet. I don't think there's any gymnast in the world who could do that. I think that it would take them quite a long time to be able to learn that. Now, to be fair, uh, something like the pommel horse would be incredibly difficult for parkour athletes to learn. But nonetheless, I would say that you could, you could make a very good argument that the level of skill being demonstrated in parkour currently is comparable to the level of skill that is being demonstrated in gymnastics. Um, now, if we look at track and field, uh, this is a little bit harder comparison. Uh, You'd think it'd be easy, but we can see in a video if someone did three flips, we can't know exactly how far they jumped. And a lot of times parkour athletes aren't measuring precisely how far they jumped. But what I understand is that the best athletes in parkour are now jumping something like 20 foot gaps. The largest that I've had a, a strong confirmation of are two jumps. One is a 22 foot jump with a six foot drop by Joseph Henderson. The other is an 18 and a half foot jump with a one and a half foot rise by Jimmy Pereira. Um, but let's say that it's true that parkour athletes are now jumping approximately 20 foot gaps. Um, that seems a lot less than what you see in track and field. The world record in track and field is 29 feet, 10 inches. However, in track and field, um, very few people have ever jumped 29 feet. 27 to 28 feet is considered a world-class jump, right? So. And then consider that track and field athletes are jumping into a pit, which means that they get to land on their butt. They don't have to land on their feet. Um, and they can be a less, they can be more reckless because they're not potentially wrecking their body on concrete. So how much might that take away? And then consider that uh, track and field athletes are running 19 steps on average into their, their takeoff, whereas parkour athletes are running somewhere between six to nine steps. Uh, very few athletes are going as far as 10 steps out and prepping for a run. If you look at a 10 foot run up, uh, Mitchell Watt is a great 28 foot long jumper, did a, you know, a really big jump from 10, 10 steps. Um, 
he did 25 feet. If you count for the pit, you know, maybe that's 24 feet, maybe that's 23 feet. Um, so it looks to me like elite parkour athletes are somewhere around 90% of the way towards where uh, track and field athletes are for jumping. And, and then, you know, so the best parkour athletes as jumpers are now maybe 90% of the best track and field athletes. And the best uh, gymnasts or, or acrobats are pretty much at the level of elite gymnasts. That's my claim. And I think you can quibble with it, but it's close. It's very close to true. So it's very close to accurate, I should say. Now, this is an extraordinary thing, if it is true, right? It's an extraordinary accomplishment because this is 20 years that this sport has been widely known. And in that time, there's been very little money invested in this sport. There's no coaches um, or very few coaches. It's not no coaches. There's a number of coaching facilities around, but most of these athletes have, are achieving this level without a strong coaching. Um, they don't train the number of hours that they did. They mostly didn't start as young as elite gymnasts or elite track and field athletes. So there's something really unique about what's happening here. I believe that this is for the same reason that it's much more effective to learn fighting through MMA where you're going to be facing a resisting opponent all the time. The, if the best athlete who can fight is the one who's attuned themselves to the environment of dealing with an opponent in many different ways, the best locomotive athlete in the same way is somebody who has attuned themselves to as many different environmental conditions to express locomotion as possible. So if you want someone who can really land a punch, you want someone who's landed a punch on thousands of people. If you want someone who can really control a jump, you want someone who's done thousands of jumps in various conditions. And that has taught their nervous system how to be controlled and powerful in, you know, in, in many different ways. So the lesson here is that the environment teaches us. This is, I believe, what's happening. Uh, I think there are many, there are multiple factors here, right? I believe that, that, that parkour athletes calibrate themselves to the flow state really well, and this allows rapid learning. This is the argument that Stephen Kotler made in Rise of Superman. Um, we'll go into that another time. But I think fundamentally, one of the aspects that's allowing the rapid growth of skill in parkour is the fact that they're exposing themselves to a wide variety of environments, and that this gives them tons of information which allows them to become better controlled. There's interesting research that comes out of the track and field community that backs this up. They found that most track and field jumpers jump to, um, when they do full effort jumps, they're jumping as far as they can in the pit with no target other than getting as far as possible. So they did an experiment where they had people jump to targets, specific targets, submaximal targets. And they did that repeatedly and changed the depth of the target. And over time, they found that the athletes who had a target to aim at made better gains in their maximal distance than the athletes who were just going for maximal distance every time. So there's something about having more information in the environment that allows the nervous system to become more effective at controlling movement. So the last example of this that I wanted to bring up in this particular talk is the example of the team sports. So traditionally in team sports, um, there is a lot of emphasis on technical drilling of movement, the same way that you see in gymnastics and the same way that you see in traditional martial arts. Um, so for instance, you could do an agility ladder or a change of direction drill, three cone drill. All of these are supposed to teach the mechanics um, of how you change direction in action. The problem is that now people have done research and said, how does this transfer to the uh, field of play? If I know someone's three cone drill, um, if I, or if I train someone at the three cone drill, and then I look at how they perform in the field, was there a significant increase in performance? And what they find is no, there's not. So what actually turns out to be effective is games or drills that retain um, some free play element, right? So if I play a game with you where uh, or if two players play a game where they have to react to each other in order to change direction, that's going to have higher transfer to the field. And we can see this, this is basically the same principle as why kata doesn't work in martial arts. An agility ladder drill or a three cone drill is essentially the 
team sport equivalent of kata in martial arts or forms in martial arts. Whereas a 1v1 a game situation is like sparring, right? So sparring makes good athletes. Agility drills don't. They may have a role um, as a small piece of making change if there's something you very specifically need to address, but you're leaving a ton of the um, of, of what's necessary to actually make that athlete adaptive in the field of play on the table when you go to these technical drills as the primary purpose. So what we see now is um, it's there's a, a wonderful way to think about this is that there's the output of a skill and there's the input that allows you to know what skill to output. Right? When you practice a punch in isolation, you're practicing the output. Right? Um, and if you don't even punch a heavy bag, you're not even necessarily uh, doing the correct type of outputting. Right? You don't have the feedback to know if the punch is really hitting with force. Um, but you're getting no input about when you can effectively punch someone, when you can close range, right? how close someone needs to be for you to be able to hit them. All of that is being left on the table. You're not getting that information. So you're getting, we've focused on the mechanics and the techniques under this idea that there's a kind of like a, uh, a, a, a mental model in your head of a skill and that when that model is routinized and made correct, then you'll be able to apply that skill in application. And so most of our training time was spent on building these routinized skills, but we weren't addressing the input that tells you what to do. And it turns out that even in the, uh, in the level of skill, it's not necessarily the case that there's something like a routine. A skill is more like an attunement between um, a specific environment and the action capabilities of the athlete, right? It's about recognizing those things and being able to put them together. So um, in team sports now, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing the smartest coaches, the uh, leading edge of coaches, starting to look for how do I expose the, the athlete to as many environments that offer information that's relevant to the physical tasks that they're trying to accomplish as possible. So if you want to be great at locomotion, you need to run, jump, climb, move, flow over as many environments as possible. If you want to be great at fighting, you need to get in there and practice games that are uh, that that mimic combat as closely as possible without exposing you to too much injury, um, with as many people as possible or as many situations as possible. Right? You need to get in there and be physical. If you want to be great at team sport, you need to run, jump, climb. Or sorry, not run, jump, climb, but you need to run jump, cut, change direction, um, throw, catch, carry um, in a situation where you're working against other opponents and for and with other people because those are critical to team sport. So we're seeing the same central insights being generated across all of these disciplines. So we think this is the heart of becoming a truly good mover. It is not about what kind of patterns you can control. It's about what kind of problems you're capable of solving. In order to get good at solving problems, you can't just practice patterns. You have to expose yourself to a wide set of problems to solve. So um, that, that has now described in this language that's coming out of ecological dynamics, and um, you know, which is ecological psychology combined with dynamical systems. Ecological psychology is the psychology that essentially asks, you know, not what's in your head, like what are the models inside your head, but what is your head inside of? What is the world outside? What is the information that it's giving to you to allow you to direct action towards goals? Um, we need to think about what we're perceiving and that, that ecology of, a, of what's out there is what directs us towards being able to actually take action. So dynamical systems then is this idea of how some systems behave in a non-linear way. And we could go much deeper into that if you want to watch some of the ideas I've had around dynamical systems. Talk, check out the how, the how and why or the um, how, to, how to build movement talk that we've given. So what I want to talk about here is constraints, affordances, and perception action coupling, because these are relevant to to what we're trying to accomplish with educating athletes and creating that universal human athletic blueprint and how all these three disciplines come together. So a constraint is basically the 
Um, it's the limitations within which an action must be made, right? So we all face the constraint of gravity. It's a universal constraint. You cannot jump and just keep floating because gravity accelerates you down to the ground at 9.8 meters per second square, right? That's, that's going to be true every time, right? So we, we have to, we have to be, all of our behavior has to be attuned to gravity. You know, if you don't, if you're not well attuned to gravity, you're going to fall down. So that's a constraint, right? You, you, you can't get outside of it. Um, the flip side of a constraint is an affordance, right? Just as gravity forces us to, uh, makes lots of types of movement not possible for us, it also makes certain types of movement possible. Walking works because gravity pulls you down and there's ground reaction force that pushes you back up. Now, when you can't walk very easily in space in a free, uh, in a um, zero gravity environment, it, it doesn't afford the same type of movement, right? You know, to give a parkour example, right? A wall is designed to constrain you so that you cannot walk through it, right? So if you're walking down the street and there's a wall of a business next door, that wall is telling you you're not allowed to enter here through, through walking. It's a constraint. However, what a parkour athlete sees is an affordance. Here is a wall which I can run up. Here's a wall which I can jump to. Here's a wall which I can flip off of, right? So now we've taken that, that environment and now we've seen how it affords us some potential. So um, a mug, right, has certain affordances. It is easy to grip, right? It is easy to fill with liquid. The liquid doesn't fall out of it. It's easy to bring to our mouth and drink out of. All of this is specific to our action capabilities as human beings. I can, I can grasp this because of the hand, the shape of my hands. I can drink out of it because of the shape of my mouth. A mug doesn't afford hardly anything, you know, or it doesn't afford the same things to a dog, right? A dog cannot grasp this, right? A dog cannot bring it to its mouth. And a dog doesn't drink by pouring things into its mouth. If you put it on the ground, you know, the dog can lick water out of it. It's not a particularly great place for a dog to lick water out of because it's a very narrow chute. So something like a bowl has better affordances for a dog. So we see the world based on our action capabilities, how our body is constructed, and the information that is in the environment that tells us how we can interact with it. So once we understand this, we understand that in order to express a skill, it's always expressed in relationship to an environment. If we practice the skill outside of that relationship to an environment, we are not doing what's called good perception action coupling, right? So when I practice a punch against the air, the problem is that in order to apply that punch, I need to be able to perceive when an opponent is open to be punched, right? In order to actually be agile on the field of play in soccer or basketball or football, I need to be able to anticipate where my opponent is going to move to, read their body, and recognizing which change of direction is going to allow me, afford me the opportunity to get past them, you know, and to the hoop or to the goal, okay? So if I practice change of direction, it's gonna have minimal carryover because it's not perception action coupled. So what we're seeing here is in parkour, your you're attuning your perceptual system to your environment every time you go out in it, and you're building a set of physical action capabilities that allow you to move that environment. In, in MMA, in jujitsu, in boxing, you're attuning to moving with another human being. Same thing in team sport, only now the set of tasks is slightly different, and you have more opponents and you have collaborators, right? But fundamentally, you're doing a lot of similar things, right? If you're, a, if you're an NFL lineman, you're doing basic grappling moves, you're swimming past people, you're arm dragging people. It's similar to, uh, to combat. Um, it's very closely aligned to combat. A stiff arm is a strike. If you're trying to box someone out in, uh, in, in an NBA game, you know, you're, you're sitting down on your hips and pushing them out. That's that same ability to get underneath someone's hips is critical to grappling. Okay, so there's, there's an interrelationship here and all of them 
You can't get good at that without that interaction with the environment that gives you the right information. So what this central lesson that we're learning from all three of these disciplines is, is that it's the game that is the primary teacher, right? Um, or it is, you know, it is live interactions that are primary teacher, right? We can see that agility drills are kata for team sport athletes. And in a sense, track and field and gymnastics are, 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 are rote pattern approaches to learning basic locomotive skills. Whereas parkour is a attunement to the environment oriented approach to learning those locomotive skills. And I believe that you're going to get the best and most robust movers when you combine all of these things. That's what we're really looking at is if you want to be an athlete who can do everything that a human being should be able to do, you should be able to locomote through your environment. You should be able to move effectively with other people. You should be able to deal combatively with another person. You should be able to cooperate with other people. You should be able to throw and catch and carry and strike and um, you know, manipulate objects powerfully. Those are the fundamental human tasks. If you look at how children play in every culture in the world, you'll see that they replicate all of these in their play. A well-socialized child with ample opportunity to play and well-socialized playmates, lots of good stuff in their environment is going to explore all of these because they're fundamental to the human being's movement adaption. We, we love to watch team sports because they replicate patterns that are important throughout human evolution. We are the only species that can throw at a moving target, right? So quarterbacks are sexy because they're, they're showing us something that's fundamentally human. So we need, um, if we want to get the most out of our physical culture, understanding that it is in these games that there is the most to learn, there is the most information, that is a critical lesson. Now, there, there's obviously a point at which that fails, right? You can't play 11 on 11 football all the time and you can't get all of the adaptions that you're looking for just through the game. But the better that you can, the more representative you can make the, the drill that you use to isolate out a specific physical attribute or skill that you want to develop, um, the more that you can make that representative of the game while allowing you to do what you're uh, trying to, or to address what you're trying to address, that's what's going to make the most effective transfer. What we say with Evolve Move Play is always train at the highest level of complexity, which allows you to attain the adaption that you're seeking, right? So if I can get flexible while doing high kicks on a heavy bag, um, or doing high kicks in sparring, then I don't need to spend any time doing splits because it's much more isolated. It doesn't have as many effects. Now, on the other hand, if I really struggle with my mobility and it is very important for me to be able to kick high and kick someone in the head, then spending some time in the splits might be a useful um, use of my time. And that's going to depend on the athlete and their individual needs. But a lot of times we start by trying to break down and build these things from isolation. We say, okay, we're gonna train splits, we're gonna train this, we're gonna build them piece by piece. And we don't spend nearly enough time at the level of the game and use that as a way to recognize what's actually missing in the athlete. We might say that an athlete needs the splits when they don't need the splits at all, right? Um, the FMS, the functional movement screen was developed um, you know, in the 1990s, I believe, and, you know, became very popular with, with people working with team sport athletes all over the world. And the idea was that fundamentally there would be some predictiveness of this model, right? It's basically like uh, a series of static movement tests um, that don't have any perception action coupling and that test mobility and kind of motor control in, in very specific environments, right? Like an overhead squat and a lunge. And so the idea was that if you know that an athlete doesn't perform well on this, they're probably not going to perform as well in the field and they're more likely to get injured. But it turns out there's very little correlation. Some of the very best athletes score terribly on this. One of my uh, friends and, and, uh, and students, Michael Tankovich, uh, he worked for the Seattle Seahawks. He worked with uh, Marshawn Lynch, one of the best uh, running backs in, uh, in NFL history. And, the dude would fail everything in the FMS. He was incredibly stiff, but guess what? Um, he didn't need that in order to be one of the best running backs in the world on an NFL Sunday. So we can't assume that we know the ingredients if we're not studying 
the, the most important information, which is within the game. So we have to play the game. Now, one really important thing that we can think about within this is the role of variability, right? So traditionally, under traditional motor learning approach, where you think of skill as a rote pattern, you think of variation in the execution of that skill traditionally as noise, right? So if, you know, from one, you know, if I take a shot in basketball or I do a precision jump and it looks different from one to another, there's some archetypal perfect pattern that should be expressed and one or both is deviating from that. So that that's the model that a lot of people are playing with and we're trying to instruct people towards these, these perfect patterns. However, um, that's not how it turns out to be. It, it doesn't turn out to be the case that we see um, that the least variability in execution of a skill translates to the highest mastery within that skill. If you look at an elite um, shooter in the NBA, like someone like Stephen uh, Curry, what you'll find is that his motor activation patterns in getting his shot off are more variable than almost anybody else's. Now you might say, wait, I don't understand. There's, you know, his, his, his release is incredibly consistent. And that's true. Um, but there's two elements of variability. One element of variability is what we might call negative variability. That's variability that takes us away from what we're trying to do. But the other aspect of variability is positive variability, which actually creates a buffer around the skill that we're trying to do. So a very simple uh, mental model about this that I got from Rob Gray of the Perception Action Podcast is imagine that you're having to press down on two scales and you have to keep the pressure on those scales uh, at a total of 10 newtons of force. Um, so you might push down on this scale with five newtons and this scale with five newtons. And you could say that this is optimal technique, five and five. Now, if this goes to six and this goes to six, then the skill that we failed the skill, right? But if this goes to six and this goes to four, if the output that we're looking for is 10, we haven't failed. We've discovered another way to achieve the same effect. And the same is true, obviously, of seven and three and three and seven and you know, on down the line. So now what we have is 10 variations of the skill, or 20 variations, I don't know, you can do the math. There's a bunch of variations of the skill now that achieve the same, uh, uh, that achieve the same effect. And the effect solving the problem is actually what we need. So now you can see that what a athlete is doing as they're practicing movement is not as simple as learning the ideal what they're doing is exploring all of the space that allows them to achieve the output. Now, some things can be need to be varied in order to make a skill stable, where some things have to be very, very consistent. So the best shooters in the NBA have consistent releases, or relatively consistent releases. Um, that's something that, that doesn't tend to, to respond well to a lot of, uh, of variability. However, to get that shot off, they need to be able to do it with their body going forward, their body going backwards, their body going to the side, out of a crossover dribble, out of a dribble, out of a catch, um, with somebody's hand in their face, with somebody actually hitting them as they're taking off. In order to do that, there's many, many variations in how they're activating all the muscles in their body that are necessary in order to make that consistent shot actually work. So variability is key. And so what we can see then is, Practicing just for perfect technique is actually denying our ac uh, ourselves access to the variability that will make us successful movement problem solvers in a real situation. So this is again why I think that parkour athletes are, sh are rapidly reaching parity with gymnasts and, um, and track and field athletes is essentially because they're getting a better education in motor variability by exposing themselves to high variabilities in the environments in which they practice, which is making for a more robust movement problem solving ability in their motor learning system. Now, another aspect of this that is very important to my work is the role of the natural world, right? So if we think about the, the variations in the environment as giving us the ability to attune to what are the constraints that I'm facing? What is, what does this afford me or what are my affordances? 
Um, you can think of that as the information that specifies how I can act. What is the specifying information in the environment? Now, in an environment that has too little specifying information, it's hard to create consistent movement. What we see very commonly is if you're asking an athlete to perform a bear crawl on the ground, you might want them to do a contralateral pattern where when one hand moves forward, the opposite leg is moving forward, right? Um, however, many athletes, maybe even most athletes, will adopt an ipsorolateral pattern where when one hand moves forward, the same side leg is moving forward. It's very hard to coach athletes verbally to control this. However, if you take them into nature and let them climb on a tree and ask them to get down on all fours, almost everyone will automatically adopt a contralateral pattern. Now, you don't need to be on a tree branch for this to be true. You could be on a two by four in um, in the middle of a gym and you'll get similar perceptual information which will allow you to better control that skill. However, what I found through years of teaching in nature, having had many years of teaching in a gym and then many years of teaching outdoors in an urban environment, is that overall athletes tend to self-organize and acquire fundamental locomotive skills faster in natural environments. And I believe this is because the natural environment has higher variation than a urban environment or a gym environment. Not only does it have higher variation, so therefore more perceptual information to attune to, but you could speculate from an evolutionary perspective that we are, that we are um, inherently built basically to attune to that information because we evolved for almost all of our evolution in natural environments, not, um, not artificial environments which we had created. So, Natural movement in some sense, or natural parkour, is an extension of what's making parkour more effective than traditional track and field and gymnastics as a system, right? So I think that if we look at all these, right, we start to now map out this idea of what it is to be a natural athlete. Traditionally, there's this idea of people who pick up sports well. And there's some inklings that a lot of people have had that like farm boys tend to do this better than gym rats, right? If you want an athlete who's going to be good, not just at bench pressing, if you have two athletes who are good at bench pressing, um, and one of them is good at bench pressing because he spent a lot of time in a gym, and one of them is good at bench pressing because he's a really strong kid from a farm, the really strong kid from the farm is more likely to perform well on the field, right? So there's this idea of farm boy strong, which is kind of related to the idea of, of the natural athlete. Now, what I think is that a natural athlete is a human being who's been well attuned to the most relevant forms of perceptual information and built the action capabilities to match themselves to that over a broad variety of contexts. And the fundamental skills that we see in every sport are, can you locomote yourself through the environment? Now, in many of the environments that we play in have been very simplified, like a, a football field is a very simple environment until you add the players. But um, when you watch baseball, you might watch somebody uh, run up a wall, do a wall run like you'd see in parkour, only they have to catch a basketball or have to catch a baseball. Um, when you see someone doing uh, in football, you see people hurtling, uh, hurtling other players, dive rolling over other players, flipping over other players, vaulting other players. All of this obviously related to the fundamental skills of being able to locomote through your environment. So we have locomotions from the environment. Can you? Run, jump, climb, swim, these are fundamental. Every sport takes place in some kind of environment. Do you have you know, broad environmental locomotive capacity? Um, training in, in, in flat ground to me is, is, a, is a very uh, poorly, it, it, it's very information poor as an approach to learning real movement competence. So can you locomote? Can you manipulate objects? Can you throw, catch, carry, strike something, right? So throw a football, throw a baseball, shoot a basketball, catch a pass, throw a pass, catch a baseball, catch a basketball, uh, catch a football, um, carry the football, right? Not get it knocked out of your arm. Uh, strike something with a bow, with a, you know, baseball bat, strike something with a tennis racket, strike something with a, um, with a hockey stick, right? These are the fundamental tasks, right? Uh, and then can you deal with another human being? Can you take contact? Can you take collision from another human being? Can you grapple? Can you strike, right? A, uh, a NFL running back striking someone 
with a stiff arm, right? Fundamental mechanics that are similar to throwing a, a cross in, um, in boxing, only done while running, okay? So all these things are related and an athlete who's been exposed to all of them is gonna have a base that's gonna allow them to be successful and they're less likely to have chinks in their armor as they move up through the different levels of the sport. The problem is that we've now built a, a movement paradigm around building more and more specialization of athletes from an earlier and an earlier age while we're denying them access to moving in nature as we've all become urbanized. We're not spending our time on the farms, becoming farm boy strong and denying kids access to unstructured play. So what we're seeing is that despite the fact that we've specialized athletes and we have tons of money that goes into AAU basketball and AAU football, right? Um, we've, we're creating athletes who can jump higher, can you know, lift heavier weights, they're more explosive, they're bigger, you know, they're on more steroids. Despite that fact, injury rates are accelerating across all of our major sports. We're making people who are fragile. We're making people who are uh, you know, not functional human beings at the base of their f athletic ability. Um, to quote Ido Portal, we are humans first, we are special, uh, we are generalist movers second, and we are specialist last. Right now, we are trying to jump way right past building your fundamental human capacities, right past building your general movement capacities, and into that specialist. And even the stuff like, you know, to be frank, Ido stuff, it's very specialized to me. It's movement on flat ground, it's hand balancing, it's gymnastics ring strength. These are not the natural expressions of human movement. This is not what we evolved for. We evolved to be able to move through the natural world, to be able to fight, to be able to cooperate and hunt, and to be able to throw, you know, catch. All those things were basically related to hunting tasks. So I believe that if we take this constraint-led idea, right, what is the information that we are attuning ourselves to? If we understand that, and we understand the evolutionary perspective on a human being, the universal human athletic blueprint is do the run, jump, climb, right? That's like parkour, but maybe primarily in nature. Obviously, do some urban stuff if you want to be able to be good at moving in urban spaces. Um, play with objects, right? And move with other human beings. And what we've done now with Evolve Move Play is we started to put these together in a way that's totally unique. So I'm gonna go into that in another one, why you should come train with us and what we're doing and how we're taking aliveness to the next level, but we're not gonna go into that in this podcast. What I wanted to say is if you are buying what we're putting down and you want to have better perception action coupling, if you wanna have learn more lessons from your physical practice and you want to incorporate more games. Well, you can go out and it, there's lots of opportunities for you, right? Go play some pickup basketball, play, go play some pickup soccer, right? Go do a uh, jiu-jitsu class, go find your local parkour community. There's resources that are out there. We're publishing a PDF. You can find it in the, um, uh, in the description of this, uh, you know, in the show notes here. Um, and it's nine basic games that you can start playing that is going to be really great. More resources there to help you support getting started with this play. You're going to get a lot out of it. Now, if you really want to get the most out of it and you want the safest, the most progressive thing, coming to work with us is going to be the most powerful way you can do that. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we've got the spring retreat coming up. We also have a fall retreat that will be coming later in the year. Um, we've got two-day seminars coming. We've got our online course. If you want to get involved, you know, reach out to us. Let us know what you're interested in. Um, check the, the show notes and get on a call to join us for one of our retreats. Fundamentally, experience, a, you know, it's, it's the same thing as the attunement that you get to the environment through running through an obstacle course over and over again. When you're coaching, every time that you go through solving a problem, you get to see more and more of the details about that problem. You get to see it better. And so you get to build a road that is more refined and less likely to trip you up and get you stuck and get you potentially injured. So there's an enormous value to, um, to going to the people who have experience with this. And as far as I can tell, nobody has explored the intersection of these things like we have. Nobody has looked at movement from this perspective of aliveness, not just in martial arts, but beyond it and then connected that to the ideas of ecological dynamics and constraints led approach and all those things. So this is what we need to be doing. This is the next step guys. Um, and we're really looking forward to having you guys join us on the journey. 
look forward to uh, sharing more about how we're putting these together and what the next step and why each of these things, you know, mixed martial arts has a lot to teach us. Aliveness in martial arts has a lot to teach us, but there's also a lot of errors being made in the pedagogy within martial arts, even now. Parkour has a lot to teach us. There's some real missing, big missing pieces in parkour as a system for truly developing locomotive ability. The constraint-led approach has a lot to teach us, but there's some missing pieces there, I believe, as well. Uh, I think that when you see how we're putting these things together, you're going to be extremely excited. So that's going to be the topic of our next conversation. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.